All right, guys, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, so uh, quickly, um, to, there's a tutorial on 5G technology. Uh, as, as, as you're no doubt aware, uh, there are many things that make up 5G, right? So I'll be focusing on a few things that impact us as, as IP, optical engineers, and so on. So the, um, um, the, the purpose of this is, is, is to give you um, an introduction to some of these technology elements of 5G, right? So I, I try not to assume uh, too much prior knowledge about um, mobile technology, about RF technology, and so on. Um, I try and approach it from the perspective of an IP engineer, which is really what I am as well. Um, so, so I hope that kind of uh, fits in with your expectations. So um, about me, uh, my name is uh, Paresh, Paresh Khatri. I'm, I'm, I'm the, um, the, the chief architect for um, the, the IP and optical networks division for Nokia for Asia Pacific, um, based in Brisbane, Australia. Um, this, is, this is really the first time I'm, I'm, I'm conducting this session in this format. So I've, I've got a bunch of content. I may not actually finish all of it, right? So the plan is to keep going until time runs out and then I stop. Because um, I think <laughs> I think it's a better approach where I, I, I cover things uh, a, a smaller number of things well than try and rush through everything. The slides will be there, um, so reach out to me over the next day or two. More than happy to sit down and talk about some of these um, things. So um, my clicker is not working. Just, sorry, I'll just have to do this. So a whole bunch of uh, topics. Um, like like I said, it's a bit. Um, no, no, that's okay. Don't worry about. It's, it's a Mac anyway, so is it going to work? All right, I, I, might, I might try that. Um, give, me, give me a second. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly, this could be a very short tutorial. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so like I said, a, a somewhat ambitious list of uh, things that I wanted to cover um, today. So I'll look at some of the use cases for 5G, you know, what is actually driving us to look at 5G as, uh, you know, a, a technology evolution for mobile networks. I'll talk about um, evolution within the radio space, right, which is, which is quite key to 5G. I'll look at what we call functional splits within the radio access network. If this doesn't make any sense right now, that's okay. Um, that's the intention. We'll, we'll try and sort of you know, clarify some of that as I go along. I'll talk a little bit about the 5G next generation core. Um, and you know, if, if, if time permits, I'll take you through a, uh, a dimensioning exercise for building a 5G backhaul network, which, which is you know, quite enlightening because it, 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 it really brings out the uh, the need to relook at how we build networks and the amount of capacity that's required. Um, I must also warn you that I'm recovering from a sore throat, so at some point I may lose my voice, but hopefully it's not before the end of the tutorial. Um, okay, so motivations and use cases, right? Um, it's, it's, I think, instructive to look at the different generations of mobile technology and what we've actually tried to achieve with this, right, before we look at 5G, because 5G is so, so different. And, and, and I find it useful to, to put it up uh, against the graph like this. So on the, on the x-axis, you've got the, the number of subscribers, right? And, and the subscribers, well, call it endpoints, actually. That, that's probably a better term. So number of humans or machines or things, right, as we call them today. And on, on the y-axis, you've got the amount of traffic per subscriber per month, right? Um, now. If, if, if you look at 2G, right, 2G was all about uh, voice calls, right? It was about voice calls, it was about audio. We had a little bit of data that came in, at which, which kind of kicked it off with, with GPRS and Edge and so on. But it's still predominantly a, 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 a voice environment. And, and so we see the, the graph was actually very flat, right? So you had a number of subscribers, but the, but the traffic per subscriber on average was actually quite low. In, in fact, we didn't really think about 2G in terms of, of data traffic, right? 
because it was all about calls and uh, text messages and so on. Um, 3G came along and it, it kind of ushered in uh, the whole concept of mobile broadband. And if, even with 3G, right, day one capability in terms of the data capacity of 3G was, was actually quite limited. It was an improvement over, four, uh, over 2G, but it was still not great. And as, as time went along and we introduced HSUPA, HSDPA, and so on, it, it, it kind of ramped up the, the amount of capacity you could have for the purpose of, of data, right? 4G um, came next, and is, well, I guess still here. Um, 4G really took it up a notch, right, um, in, in terms of capacity, but also in terms of the architecture, because 3G had a, a sort of a circuit switch component to it, as well as a packet switch component to it. Um, with 4G, it all became IP, right? So, so that was one, one big change. And, and the second one was that, you know, we had, we had more capacity to work with. So, so 4G today is, is adequate. I mean, it, it kind of brought in video communications, right? So we can do, we, we, I mean, you know, that, that is one of the, one of the major uh, contributors to, to 4G traffic. Um, so it, it kind of brought in that sort of visual experience over mobile networks. So you know, the, the question is, how do we address the, the use cases of the future, right? So 4G is where we are at today. But the, but the set of use cases that we have, or you know, it, it's a, um, I, I guess, a target is, is actually quite varied, right? And, and, and these use cases can, can, be, can be split into two things. So there's, there's all these consumer use cases, and then there are industrial use cases. So from a consumer perspective, mobile broadband is, is going to be there, right? We want to stream 4K over our mobile devices, over the air interface, and so on. Uh, we want to do uh, AR, VR, and so on. Um, they, there's an increasing um, uh, need to do fixed wireless access as, as an alternative um, to fixed wireline access, right, for, for reaching um, uh, consumers. There's um, you know, all these things about entertainment within vehicles and, and so on. So quite a, quite a number of use cases within the consumer space. And then there's a lot of use cases within the industrial environment, right? So uh, this is all about automating at, at scale, right? So critical uh, infrastructure that needs to be, to be automated and, and so needs to communicate in real time. Uh, teleoperation, you know, uh, you know, haptic kind of remote control. Um, you, you see all of these different different sorts of um, sensor arrays and so on. So when, when we put when we look at all of these from the perspective of what it means for the transport network, the IP network, the optical network that that you know connects up all these things, then it, it kind of pays to to look at it from from the perspective of these things, right? Uh, from the perspective of throughput, from latency, and from reliability. Um, and, and you see that, that I'm not going to go through all of this, right? But, but you see that all of them have very different needs. Some need very high um, downlink throughput. Some, like very, uh, some need very high uplink throughput. Some need extremely low latency. Uh, some of them need to be very highly reliable, right? In terms of six nines, five nines, six nines, right? So there is, is a huge set of use cases here. Now, some things I want to call out specifically. Um, so if you look at the, the download, um, pretty high in this space here, right? For mobile broadband and for fixed wireless access. You're talking up to up, well, more than, more than gigabits, gig, gigabit per second uh, per user. Uh, so that's one. Uh, some of these require a, a very high uh, uplink capability as well. So you look at, uh, you know, I mean, it's really some of, some of the similar ones here. Uh, applications where you're actually communicating with two-way video, for example, needs uh, very high uplink uh, capability as well. And, and latency, you know, you're talking about end-to-end -end application latency that is now down to milliseconds, right? So look at some of these, like event experiences, um, some of the critical uh, automation, one to five milliseconds of application layer latency. So between, between two communicating uh, applications. This is... This is serious, right? We, we cannot do this with, with LTE today because the air interface itself adds 10 to 20 milliseconds, if not more in some cases. So it, it, it means that the solution that we have um, today with LTE does not really address all of these use cases, right? 
So what I've done here is I've, I've kind of put them up against uh, the capabilities of LTE. So I've taken the main use cases, said, can we do, it, do this with LTE? So some of them, yeah, we can with some limitations, right? So we can do mobile broadband today. Of course, we do that. The limitations come down to downlink throughput. Um, for fixed wireless, it's about well. reliability. Cost is a bit high. Uh, event experience, in terms of latency, you really can't achieve that um, interactive capability because of the high latencies that we have over mobile networks. And, and when it comes to some of these critical infrastructure uh, for industrial automation, you know, it's, there's a lot we cannot actually achieve with 4G simply because we either do not have the, um, the scale, the latency is too high, or the throughput is too low, right? So, you know, the, the spider graph kind of shows the aspirations for 5G. I'm saying aspirations because, you know, we're still working on this. We haven't achieved all of this, uh, but 5G is trying to uh, achieve that. So it's, it, it kind of plots it against different um, uh, elements, right? So the amount of data, the latency, reliability, and so on. So you see that LTE is, you know, it, it's, it's meant to be a, a small um, subset of the capabilities of 5G. So ideally, 5G kind of gives you all of that. Uh, no, I, I normally treat any, any uh, technology that, that uh, it promises everything with uh, a degree of skepticism, right? And so should you. So we'll not achieve all of this, but that's, like I said, an aspiration that we have uh, with, with 5G. So um, really, what we want with 5G is actually quite different to what we had with 4G, right? So look at these graphs, and like I said, all of them had one primary use case. Um, 2G was voice communication, 3G was voice. I mean, the voice is always there, right? But it was about bringing some broadband in. Um, 4G took it up a notch. But 5G is actually, it's a combination. It's not just about broadband. It's about all these other applications as well. So you know, right away, you know that the way we build 5G networks will be different the way we build 4G networks, because it's not a single use case that we're trying to achieve with 5G. So um, what do we want? We want to support many more users, right? So the user density has really gone up, right? You hear all this talk about IoT and the billions of devices, they'll need to communicate somehow. And, and the density will, will go up at, at least an order of magnitude, if, if not higher. We need higher data rates. We need a more consistent user experience, uh, density I've already spoken about. We need wider network coverage, right? Uh, if 5G is to be the basis for all, um, uh, you know, access layer communication, then it's, it's got to have that, that coverage. Uh, it's got to support higher battery life, so unnecessary signaling, for example, needs to be eliminated for certain use cases. And, you know, a very key thing is that we need a distributed user plane for 5G. I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later. It, it's a really key com uh, component of 5G. Um, so, it, you know, we, 5G will, will, will definitely change the world of, of mobile networking, right? Now, um, a, a, a graph, you know, from, from 3GPP, right? So, when, when 3GPP set out to um, uh, develop 5G technology, uh, they, they kind of took all of these use cases and boiled it down to three categories. So the first category is that of enhanced mobile broadband, or EMBB, right? So that's, as we know, that is, that is one of the key applications. We want to uh, be able to provide that broadband experience, but at gigabit per second speed. The, the other two are about machine-to-machine -machine communication, right? So the one is massive machine-type communication, and, and this is to facilitate um, communication between, you know, a, a very large number of uh, machine endpoints. And then th there is another one, which, which is, well, the final one is called ultra-reliable low-latency communication, or URLLC, or critical machine type communication. This is for those critical applications that, that, that need capabilities that are far um, uh, more acute, right, in terms of latency and bandwidth, uh, in terms of connection density. Than, than some of these, these other use cases. So they, they all have different needs, right? But from a um, capacity perspective, you see that the, the target here is that we should be able to achieve greater than 10 gigabit per second peak data rates. So we're talking right now about 10 to 20 gigs per second. 
uh, there are many factors that go into it, and it's very important to understand what peak means. Uh, I'll, I'll take you guys through it. it. It's not as intuitive as you might think, uh, uh, because it's, it's slightly different in the mobile world. But I'll, I'll show you some graphs to, to really illustrate that concept. Um, the, the other one that is an aspiration of 5G is that any user should be able to get 100 megabits per second whenever they need it. Well, let me tell you, this is a lot harder to achieve than that. Demonstrating a peak is easy. Demonstrating that you always get 100 meg megabits per second is very hard. I'm not sure we'll get there, but once again, like I said, it's an aspiration. And you got 10,000 10, times more traffic, whatever that means. So when you look at um, the changes versus LTE, right, you see that, okay, the data rates go up, approaching 20 gig gigabit per second of peak rate. Um, the late, whoops, the latency goes down. Um, the amount of power for IoT devices should go down. Energy efficiency should go down. And, and very importantly, um, the spectral efficiency should go up. I'll talk a little bit more about this um, when we talk, uh, when we go to the radio section. But that is actually key uh, to 5G as well. So a few use cases. I will not um, just, I will not spend too much time on these. But um, you know, one, one of them that, that keeps coming up is virtual reality, right? So uh, virtual rea high def virtual reality. Um, and if, if, if you look at um, the um, the requirements for virtual reality, one, one of one of the key ones, uh, apart from the bandwidth required, is that of latency, right? Uh, so with uh, with virtual reality, there's this um, uh, this human reflex that comes in. It's, it's called the vestibulo-ocular reflex, right? So basically, what it means is that as you as, as you turn your head, right, when you've got a VR headset on, for example, the, the image is going to follow along. Otherwise, your brain gets really confused. So if there's a if there's a latency lag of more than seven milliseconds, what happens is that you, as a user of the headset, get gets very uh, get very disoriented, and there, there are I mean, you know, that's it, it's been demonstrated uh, that the people uh, end, up, end up throwing up or getting very dizzy or something. So th this is, is a real um, impact to users if the latency is higher than that. Uh, so, you know, for for high def virtual reality to work, we've got to get that latency down, and we've also got to have that um, throughput in there as well. So, so that's that's one, right? Um, the the second aspect of well, not second aspect, but but how you achieve that. Will be um, will be determined by how well you can distribute your services, right? So the communicating endpoints have to be as close together as economically possible in order to meet that need. Um, I, I will touch on that a little bit later. Um, so industrial automation, right? This is about um, automating factories, manufacturing processes, and so on. Um, it's about things like um, intrusion detection. Right, so it, you know, to, to be able to detect um, a, an intrusion and be able to, to 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 trigger something based on that activity as soon as possible, and then there's all these different factories with a multitude of sensors and so on that all need to communicate with each other. Now, in, in this environment, what what you need is you need ultra low latency for sure uh, to ensure that we can respond to these events as rapidly as possible. Uh, before it becomes uh, you know, dated. Uh, it, it needs to be uh, very reliable as well. So the um, 3GPP has, has put some um, targets in terms of reliability for some of these networks, some of the UR LLC networks, and you're looking at six nights. I mean, that's, that's insane, right? Architecting a network for six nights is, is, is pretty complicated and expensive. Okay, so um, the, the, the last one, you know, talk about latency a bit more. Um, at the end of the day, we, we start um, hitting limits of, you know, uh, physical limits when it comes to latency, right? So propagation delay is, is one, but also reducing the number of uh, routing hops, switching hops, optical hops is actually quite important. When you start talking about end-to-end -end latency, uh, that is single digit millisecond. So one way to achieve this, I mean, one way to look at this is, if, if you look at a typical um, mobile network, you've got the You've got the users here, you've got the base stations, you've got the aggregation network, you've got the core network, 
right? Um, if, if, if your content is, be, is being served from the core, core network or the core cloud or the data center that is sitting you know, somewhere in the middle of the network, then you would be looking at latencies of you know, tens of milliseconds, right? You can distribute some of this content a little bit closer to the users to try and get into the 10, 20 millisecond mark, right? The, you can take it even further where you're actually putting content right next to the base station. So there's this initiative uh, that is called multi-access edge computing, which talks about deploying compute right next to the to the cell site or at the cell site itself. So you, you can host services there, and 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 so you reduce that the latency. That still gets you down to you know um, a few milliseconds. There's also a provision within the uh, with the 3GPP mobile specifications for direct device to device communication, where you do not actually go through a cell a base station itself. Right, so it, it, it talks directly between these devices. So this is for the ultra, ultra low latency requirements that we have. So you know, there is no one size fits all here when it comes to designing the network uh, to support low latency. And, and once again, this is sort of brings out the fact that it's, you know, it, it's a single network that we're trying to build, but, but it's, it's catering for different requirements. And so different services, different applications will need to be architected differently uh, within that network. Okay, so that was just, just a bit of an introduction um, to, to 5G, you know, why we're doing it, uh, what are the motivations, and I, I think it's pretty, pretty clear. Uh, if, if you do have any questions, please, uh, please do raise your hand at any time. Um, <clears throat> in, in the rest of the um, tutorial, what I'd like to do is, is go into a little bit more detail uh, about the, the te technology elements of 5G, right, and what makes it different. So, let's let's start with spectrum, right? So, in 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 the mobile world, spectrum is is king. So you know that operators spend billions of dollars uh, buying spectrum, and it's and it's king because you know you, you cannot really share it, right? I mean, it's 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 a unique uh, capability or unique entity, so to speak. Uh, you buy a chunk of spectrum in a certain area, and you have the right to use it you know, uh, in an unrestricted fashion. So operators spend a lot of money on spectrum. The challenge we have right now is that the amount of spectrum out there that has been used for 4G and 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 the other technologies is, is somewhat limited, right? And it's you know we, we call it the sub six gigahertz range, or the, actually in, in most cases sub three gigahertz. Right, so the, the spectrum that's been used for all of these, um, no, 2G, 3G, 4G is is in this space here. So it's it's in the lower lower frequency um, area, and and there are good reasons for doing it. Right, one of one of the reasons that um, we've built networks in this uh, using this frequency spectrum is because it's got better propagation characteristics. Right, the lower the frequency the better the reach, um, you know, you get better indoor uh, performance and so on. The challenge though is, is that your um, ability to send data over the air interface to, is directly proportional to the amount of, of spectrum you have, right? So the bits per second per hertz that you can carry, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is a function of the mobile technology that you're using. So if you have more hertz to play with, you'll get better performance. So with 5G, what is happening is, th is that uh, uh, governments, regulators are opening up more spectrum. So this spectrum is going to what we call the centimeter wave and the millimeter wave. Uh, yeah, for some reason, I mean, in this uh, mobile world, they're confused. Well, they're not confused, but they use frequency for some things and wavelength for the other. We all, we all know it's the same kind of thing, right? Um, so. The, the, the intent of doing this is, is to really give us more spectrum. So whereas uh, operators today have you know, tens of megahertz of spectrum, the, the intent is that with the centimeter wave and the millimeter wave of spectrum, you'd be able to get hundreds of megahertz of spectrum, right? In some countries, they're talking about uh, up to 800 mega, megahertz of spectrum within a single band, which is huge. So that is one new thing about 5G. Now, I should also mention that um, the, the radio um, in, in 5G is called new radio, NR, 
right? Um, which, you know, I mean, I personally don't like that name because, you know, two years from now, it probably would not be as new. Um, but in the mobile world, they tend to do these things, right? Like long-term evolution, which is, wasn't long-term enough to... Anyways, uh, but that's called new radio in, in, in um, mobile terminology. So that's one, right? The second one, which I've already alluded to, is, is the fact that the, the allocation will be a lot wider because there's, there's, there's more spectrum to play with there. So uh, in, instead of having these, these narrow you know, 5, 10, 15 megahertz, 20 megahertz uh, blocks, we'll, we'll have hundreds of megahertz. And, and the higher you get in the, uh, the spectrum, the more there is available. It all comes with a price, you know, and I'll talk about that as well. The, um, the other area is, is that of MIMO, right? So MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output. And really, this is, um, I wouldn't say it's a simple technology, but it, it, it just means that we use multiple transmitters, we use multiple receivers, and we get, get certain benefits out of them, which, which I'll take you through a little bit later. Uh, with MIMO has been around for a while. Um, most LTE deployments around the world already do 2x2, 4x4, 4x2 MIMO out there. With 5G, we're taking it up a level, where it's actually becoming massive MIMO, so greater than 16 um, transmit receive. Um, the framing within 5G is being optimized, right, so that you can achieve the lower latency uh, or, or low, a millisecond type of latency. And, you know, with, with the way 4, 4G was structured, um, you just, you did not have that granularity to be able to do um, a millisecond kind of latency across the air interface. With 5G, the framing structure changes to support that. Um, okay, so two more things. So one is what we call the, uh, the RAN functional splits. Uh, don't worry about the diagram. I've got a uh, much bigger version of that, which I'll take you through. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's changing, you know, where the different functions in a radio access network reside. Yes. Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, one of the fundamental ways is that they've reduced the TTI, right, which is the, um, the, the interval that is used for transmission. So in LTE, it was like 10 millisecond above, with 5G is down to 1 millisecond. So it's, it's, not the, it's not the propagation itself, it was the, it was the framing that was kind of holding it back. And there's preemption and many other things happening with, with 5G. So not everything will get that, right, but they'll be, depending on the, um, the 5QI mar markings that they have for... Um, the quas markings they have, they'll be able to um, uh, basically preempt traffic and, and send the, the higher priority traffic uh, ahead of it to achieve the one millisecond. Um, so functional splits, like, like I said, um, I'll just, just I'll, I'll come back to it. <laughs> it's a bit hard to talk about it here. Uh, and, 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 and the final thing that I'll touch on is, is what we call CUPS, right? Uh, that stands for Control and User Plane Separation. Uh, and, and this is a key way in which we can distribute the data plane for 5G. Um, once again, more details later. So I'll, I'll touch on all of these in, in, in the slides that follow. If you do have any questions, like I said, just raise your hand. So let's start with radio evolution, right? So I spoke about, spoke about spectrum. Um, and, and what I do here is, um, you don't need to go through all of this in detail, right? But, but I, th I think there's a few key things we need to take out of this. So, you know, you've got the low band, you've got the mid band, and you've got the millimeter waves. So low band, let's just say less than three gigahertz. Mid band from three to six gigahertz. And millimeter waves, um, based on spectrum allocation today, it's, it's over 24 gigahertz. Yes. Can you step back a couple of slides to the other one that had the bands on it? Keep going. Keep that. No, next one. Uh, this next one, yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Now, what? Here we have the CM centimeter wave solid area, thirty gigahertz, but that's not appearing on your. Yeah. No. Look, I'm, I mean, it's yeah. It's you know, theoretically, a uh, centimeter wave starts at thirty gigahertz, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Well, I mean, oh, th uh, sorry, 30 to 3 gigahertz, or 3 to 30 gigahertz is centimeter wave. Okay. Yeah. So, so there are some people in the States, for example, doing um, 5G around 15 gigahertz. And uh, that would be your sort of solid area under yeah, 30 right. gigahertz. But yeah. that's not appearing in your next slide, no. three slides no. out. No. You just kind of had sub gig and where do we get uh, low yeah, band, yeah. mid band, and millimeter wave. Yeah, so 15 gigahertz, uh, I'm not sure who's doing that. Uh, AT&T. AT&T is 15 gigahertz for, for the fixed wireless access. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, there you go. So, yeah, this is not comprehensive. Let's put it that way. Um, T-Mobile is doing 26, right, for, um, for, for mobile uh, um, purposes. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I guess theoretically, when we say centimeter wave, to me, it should be um, anything more than one centimeter, less than a meter, right? So three gigahertz to 30 gigahertz and so on. Question there? In the 5G deployments, you have available bandwidth in you know parts of the spectrum in different places geographically and sure. politically and all the rest of that. So is this just agile as hell based on you land somewhere, you look for what you've got, and you wow. Yeah, it's I mean and, you know the number of bands is just just humongous, right? You know, and and in, in fact you know so there'll be there'll be bands that are being used for other purposes that are being you know repurposed for 5G. There is. There are LTE bands, 3G bands that are being refarmed now for 5G as well. So it's wow. So this is like it's, it's 189 protocols. It, well, it's not. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it complicates the, um, the the antennas for for sure because you've got to you've got to be able to deal with all of these frequencies. Well, we do that today, right? Thank God we're all smart. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Will it be the same air interface across all of the bands? No. Okay, different air interfaces. Yeah. Different air interfaces. Yeah. These, these, because I mean, obviously, for, because of the different characteristics, um, which once again will complicate things, right? So, um, yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of fun coming up. So, all right. So, getting back to this, um, the key thing to to understand here is that uh, as you as you go up the frequency range, the, there's more capacity available, right? So you're able to get better data rates. The problem is that your, your coverage goes down, right? So, so when, when, we, when we talk about uh, millimeter waves, uh, we, we've done tests that go up to a couple of kilometers, but those are tests. In reality, you will be looking at cell sizes that are 100 meters, 200 meters. So uh, the reach is actually quite low. And, and to, to get Effective coverage, you will need a lot of cells, a lot of small cells, microcells, pico cells, and so on, in order to get you that, that coverage. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a usual thing. Nothing comes for free here, right? So either you get um, coverage or you, or you get the, the data rate. Um, so low band, you know, as, as I said, mostly used for um, you know, LTE, 3G, and so on today. Um, all of those bands uh, are available for 5G. As, as well. Um, typical rates, you're looking at you know, around hundreds of megabits per second. And uh, for the mid-band, uh, 3.5 gigahertz, that, that's a you know, band that's being uh, used in, in quite, a few, quite a few countries uh, for the first 5G deployments. The, the good thing about the, about the 3.5 gigahertz range is, is that um, initial analysis shows that it, it's got the same simple sort of coverage as the LT1800 uh, band. Which is, which is really important because if, if you are to reuse the infrastructure today, right, where all your, all your towers are, um, you don't want any gaps. So you, you want to start off with a, 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 a uh, frequency range that actually will give you this similar sort of coverage as LTE. Uh, otherwise, there's a lot more infrastructure to be built out. Um, now, with this, you, you start to achieve the gigabit, gigabit, gigabit per second kind of um, capacity. With millimeter waves, like I said, now I mean there's there's a few here. Uh, Jonathan mentioned 15 gigahertz there as well. Um, that's when you start looking at the really really high bandwidth. So you know 5G by itself does not give it's, it's not magic, right? You still need spectrum. Uh, it it improves how you use the spectrum, but you still need a lot of spectrum. Now um, one of the one of the things that is really important to understand is th uh, we, we we talk about spectral efficiency, right? So I mentioned it earlier as well. So this is the, the number of bits per second you can get per hertz uh, on an average basis. Uh, so 
with, with 5G, there's an expectation or there's a desire to get you know, two and a half to three, maybe even six times the spectral efficiency of 4G. Uh, but that only takes you so, so far. Right? All right. So to need more spectrum in order to back it up. Okay, so, oh shit, what did I do there? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to cover this in detail, All right? Okay, so so look at MIMO, right? So I mentioned that one other way of achieving better uh, performance, better capacity over your uh, air interface is to use multiple um, transmitters and multiple receivers. Right? So you know, um, like I said, the the way mobile networks work is through frequency reuse. Right? That's why we have cells, so that you can reuse the same frequency everywhere without it interfering with the use of the frequency in you know the adjacent cell site. So we build these cell sites, the coverage is that cell, move to the next cell site, you have a coverage area, area of the other cell, but now you're able to reuse that frequency all over again. Right? So so that's that's one way we have of maximizing the frequency spectrum that we have. Now what if, what if we could be more efficient in terms of how we use the frequency within a single cell site, right? That's where the, the concept of MIMO comes in. So um, what, what MIMO does is, like I said, it, it's, it's got multiple transmitters and multiple receivers as well. So think of a base station, right, that's got multiple antennas that are transmitting. Um, there's, there's a few things you can do with it. Now, in, in, the, in the early days when... MIMO started out, it was to provide more transmit diversity. So, you know, um, what, what engineers figured was that instead of sending one stream down to the user, what if we sent that stream two different ways? And, and these were like, those uh, sent in such a spa spatial way that uh, they were orthogonal to each other, so they would not interfere with, these, with each other. So you sent the same signal uh, in, in, in uh, two different directions, so to speak. So the receiver receives both of these. And now it can make a decision on which one's a better signal, right? So you improve your capability through the network. Some of, one of them may have bounced through multiple buildings. One of them had, may have had a clearer path, right? So the, the, the hope is that one signal is, is significantly better than the other one. And so choose the better of the two. So that's how this, this whole MIMO thing started off. Right, so so this is called transmit diversity. But then, what what um, what became obvious was that you know if if we could do um, transmit diversity, you know if if we were smarter about how we how we did this, could we instead of sending the same signal twice in two different directions, why don't we send multiple streams that are independent of each other across the same area interface? So in a way we start doing spatial multiplexing, right? And, and this is where the, the, the concept of spatial multiplexing came about. So now, if you could have two independent streams running across the same frequency and time domain resources, then you effectively double the capacity of your channel, right? So this is, this is where the concept of MIMO came about. Now, in LTE, um, uh, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, they, they, there are Quite a few deployments are two by two, four by four. Uh, a lot of handsets support it, right? Like like the iPhone, um, the XR I think supports four by four. Samsung Galaxy Nine um, supports four by four for LTE as well. So there's a lot of support for that in the um, in the user equipment as well. Now with 5G, we, we take it up a notch, right? So in, instead of just doing four by four, 5G will do much much higher. So the um, the configurations we're looking at now are, are things like 16 by 16 or 32 by 32 or 64 by 64 or 32 by, uh, or 64 by 32. So really taking it up a notch so that, you know, you could send up to, say, 16 or 32 parallel streams from the same base station, but they do not actually interfere with each other. And that way you dramatically increase the capacity of that channel, right? So... This is yet another way that, we, that, we, that we're achieving higher capacity. Now, we, we need to put this into perspective as well. So if, if you look at the lower bands, as we said, the, the main issue with the lower bands is that we don't have enough spectrum. 
So with the lower bands, uh, massive MIMO actually helps you to get even higher data rates or higher data rates, right, compared to what you would have done without it. Work in the lower bands? I mean, the antenna size for um, the lower bands is quite big, and massive MIMO means more than 16 elements, right? Sure. I, I've never seen massive MIMO below a gigahertz. In uh, antennas where? On the base station? Yeah. Have you seen the latest antenna designs? They actually have really Sub gigahertz strong. massive yeah. MIMO. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we, c we can chat about that. But okay. Yeah, it's, uh, so I mean, maybe maybe not sub gigahertz, so to speak, uh, but but definitely in the in the 1.8, 2.1, 3.5 range. Yeah. 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 Sub. Yeah. Okay. I'll take it back. Maybe not 600 megahertz or 700 megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's you know you, you still need you still need devices that support it as well at the other end to get the, get the most out of it. Um, so for lower bands, you know you get you get higher data rates. For higher bands, um, it it lets you, you know, get better better propagation distances, right? So it helps to increase the reach of the of the signal. Uh, so it helps in both ways. Okay, so I've done some analysis here based on some, some work that we, we, we've, we've done with our initial 5G testing, right? So the, the configuration I've taken here is, um, let's just say for frequency range uh, for, for the 3.5 gigahertz band, and you've got 100 megahertz to play with. Um, and the assumptions that I've made here, and this is once again based on empirical sort of data that we have, is, is that in a two by two configuration, you're getting 3.69 bits per second per hertz. Um, for the 4x4 four four MIMO configuration, you're getting about 6 bits per second per hertz. So this is roughly double what you get with, with LTE today. So it's still a, a, sub, well, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a conservative kind of number, right? Now, if, if you base it on that and use a 64T, 64R configuration uh, at the base station, so this is real. So by the way, this is um, so we actually got products that do 64T, 64R in the 3.5 gigahertz with 16 um, uh, 16 downlink layers, right? So in, in this kind of a configuration, you end up with with bandwidth that looks like this. So the average sector throughput is 369 megabits per second, assuming your you know and your UEs are two by two, and um, for four by four, it's 600 megabits per second. The peak, on the other hand, is a lot higher, right? So for four by four, you're looking about 9.75 gigs. So it immediately shows you a couple of things, right? Uh, one is that um, the ratio between the, the peak and the average is a lot higher today with 5G, uh, right? And the second one is that, you know, the, the improvement in the average sector throughput is there, but it's not it's not as massive, right? So the, the use cases that we build, I mean, the, the applications that we have need to be cognizant of the fact that, th that there is that disparity between peak rates and, and the average rate that you can get um, using this. Okay, so that, that's a little bit out about Spectrum and uh, MIMO and so on, right? So the next bit, RAN functional splits. Um, but before I do this, uh, I, I just, kind of drew a high-level view of a mobile network for people who are not really familiar with, with how these things go together. So you have your base stations, right? Uh, you have your towers, you've got stuff there, antennas, you've got some active equipment. You've got what we call the radio access network, right? That forms, um, that includes the base stations plus, you know, the air interface. You've got NGSA devices that connect to that. Now, you've got a mobile core that's sitting out there somewhere in, in the um, operator's network. And then between this, you've, you provide a backhaul network to interconnect up the access with the mobile call. Now, most of the tier one, or well, I guess most mobile operators today um, have built uh, the mobile backhaul network using IP MPLS technology, right? So um, early on with 3G, uh, it, it was, there was a mix of Ethernet uh, and IPVPNs, 
With LTE, it's predominantly IPVPN today. So there's IP routing within the mobile backhaul network running over an MPLS network. Okay, so that's just to give you some perspective of, of how these things look, right? Now, um, over the past few years, there's been a um, uh, degree of work on what we call centralized RAN. And the way um, to describe, well, I'll take you through how, what that actually means. Now, when, when we first started building mobile networks, this is what a cell site looked like, right? You had a tower, you had an antenna, right at the top of the tower. You had this active equipment sitting at the base of the, um, base of the tower. Um, and we call it the BBU, or the baseband unit. So this is where all the electronics is. That's where it does you know, all this processing. And the way we connected these things up was we ran a, you know, some coax between the antenna and this device that was sitting at the bottom of it. Now, there was a few, few challenges with, with doing things this way. Um, coax, as, as you know, is, is a lossy kind of uh, medium. And, and so there was a lot of power loss and so on that happened uh, between the antenna and, and the radio. So you needed to you know, amplify and so on, the costly exercise. So what um, operators did was they, they kind of you know, tried to optimize this architecture. And what they did was they moved some of the uh, RF processing to be co-located with the antenna itself. And this was housed in a unit called uh, a remote radio head, right, an RRH. And they left the rest of the baseband processing on the, uh, on, on the device at the bottom of the tower. Now, they had to interconnect it somehow, right? And one of the, one of the um, objectives was to get rid of coax. So they built a new interface between them. And um, this interface was used fiber. And this interface uh, was now used to transport radio signals from the antenna to the BBU over fiber, right? Um, so this was, this was one improvement. And so because they had distributed some of this functionality, we ended up calling this architecture distributed RAN. So you now the RRH and BBU are separated. So that's why it's called distributed RAN. It's not that distributed, but it's distributed at the base, base station itself. Now, what operators um, started sort of thinking about was, you know, if, if we are doing this, why don't we uh, centralize some of this BBU functionality? So instead of having a BBU sitting at every cell site, why don't we put it in a central location and, and call it, you know, a, a, a BBU hotel or something, right? That's what they call it. And if, if we did this, then there'd be a potential to reuse um, or you know, better utilize the BBU resources across multiple um, base stations there, right? The, the other factor that was important is because if, if they did that, they would need less space at the tower itself, right? We, we know site acquisition, site costs, power, cooling are very expensive. So if you could put it in a central location instead of distributing it out everywhere, you, you reduce cost in a massive way, right? So they started doing some of this. Uh, and, and so this fiber, from being like tens of meters now became a few kilometers. Um, so this started with with 4G. Um, there are some some deployments around the world, not not many, uh, but it was it was seen as a good idea. Now once I did this, we started talking about this interface as being a front hall interface, right? So back hall is what comes out of the BBU. The interface between the BBU and the remote radio head is is a front hall interface. And, and there are a couple of protocols that are used today uh, in order to transport that traffic. Uh, one's CIPRI, the other one's called OBSAI. There's um, radio over ETH. I mean, well, okay, maybe that's, that's coming later. But anyway, there's, there's a few different protocols that we use to transport um, traffic between them. So this was the genesis of this whole centralized RAN. Now, the reason I'm talking about it from a 4G perspective is because in 5G, we, we take it to a different level altogether. So, um, yeah, I might actually skip this one here. That's the same thing. It's just showing that, you know, in a DRAN, a distributed RAN, um, you can have multiple architectures, you have a backhaul network going to the core. In a centralized RAN, you've got a BBU hotel that is hosting a number of different BBUs. The only thing at the cell side is the remote radio head, 
it's, it's, it's a lot simpler. Okay, so like I said, the uh, probably the predominant protocol that is used, used by operators is called CIPRI, and, and it's, it's called uh, Common Public, or it stands for Common Public Radio Interface. Uh, it's, it's not the best protocol in the world, right? It's, what it does, it's, it simply takes uh, uh, radio signals from the antenna um, and samples them, quantizes them, puts it into, puts it onto the wire. So it's like a circuit emulation service, right? It's sending stuff even if there's, there's no traffic. It's not a packet protocol. Um, it's, it's very bandwidth heavy. Right? So for, uh, for LTE deployments, um, the way you can work it out is for every megabit of LTE traffic, you need 16.384 megabits per second of CIPRI traffic. It's a lot. It's great if you're an optical manufacturer, and I see one here. Um, <laughs> But it, 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 it's, not a, uh, it's not an efficient protocol. It wasn't designed by the ATF for sure. Um, so the reason I, I bring this up is because if we are to do centralized RAN in 5G, this becomes a real problem, right? So um, a busy slide there. I just want you, to, want you to look at this one here, right? It's showing a 4G network where the IP throughput is 150 megabits per second. And you see that this is a CRAN scenario. So your cell site is here. You've got a CRAN, uh, um, a BBU hotel here, and, and the BBU is sitting at this point. The amount of capacity you need per remote radio head is 2.45 gig gigabits per second. So this is huge, right? And, and so um, the, the only operators uh, who are doing this are those who have a lot of fiber, uh, right? in the network itself or are using some sort of optical network, uh, passive or active, right, in order to multiplex this, these different uh, CIPRI streams over the same fiber. But it's a lot of bandwidth. Now, this is, this is when you have 150 megabits per second of LTE throughput. We take a case of 5G. With 5G, as you saw, we start to hit gigabits per second of traffic. And that means that what you're carrying over the CIPRI interface would be 10, tens to hundreds of gigabits per second of traffic, right? So that is not a viable uh, option for any operator out there, right? It, it doesn't make any sense to do it. So for 5G, we started looking at different ways of slicing and dicing the radio access network. So let me, let me try and take you through this, right? We'll start with a DRAN scenario. So in a, in a DRAN scenario, like I said, we separate the radio, the remote radio head and the BBU, but they're still at the same site, right? We separate them, we connect it, connect it up with a bit of fiber, and the fiber is running you know, tens of meters. The remote radio head ha has the, the RF functions there, and the BBU does you know, a lot of processing. There are, there are five layers that we sort of you know, can categorize this processing into. So there's a layer one phi, L2 MAC, uh, uh, L2 RLC, L2 PDCP, and there's a radio resource control layer, layer three, happening on the BBU as well. So it's doing a fair bit of, fair bit of packet processing on the BBU, right? So the BBU is, is a pretty intelligent kind of device. Now, um, in a DRN scenario, the link between them is, is a piece of fiber that's running between them, okay? So with 5G, we started looking at different ways of doing this because if he if if persisted with that, the CIPRI kind of method of doing it, this would be hundreds of gigabits per second between the RU and the BBU, all right? So what's emerged is the concept of having these functional blocks of processing within the radio access network. So I'll try, I'll try and sort of simplify some of this here. So we end up with we end up with three different elements, and these are functional elements, right? Don't think of it as a physical function, although it could you know, uh, be the same as, the, as a physical function, but there are three functional components. So I'll start from the bottom. So the first one is what we call the radio unit, right? Uh, the RU. And the distinction between DRAN and this kind of a, a cloud DRAN scenario, or, a, or you know, a, um, well, this scenario here is, is that 
what we do now is we take on some of this layer one phi functionality that was previously on the BBU and move it to the remote radio head or the radio unit, right? Why do we do this? We do this so that we can make this communication a lot, a lot more efficient. So that instead of dealing with just, just samples from the, the radio signals that are coming out, we can actually packetize some of this. So by moving the, the functionality in there, we can now create a uh, output of that, that that can be packetized. It's a lot more efficient. It's a lot more compressed than Cipri. Right? Now the next thing we do here is we take these two layers, the RLC layer, the MAC layer, and whatever's remaining in the file layer, the higher part of the file layer. And, and we combine it into an element or a function that is called the DU, or the distributed unit. Now we, we draw the line at the RLC layer is because these functions are considered real-time functions. And, and what we really mean by real-time is, is that um, it, 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 it's very latency sensitive. So it needs a low latency uh, between, a very low latency between the RU and the DU element that is running the RLC function, right? So that is the delineation. Uh, and that's important because it dictates where you actually put this function. Now, what is re whatever is remaining is called the non-real-time portion. So it's the PDCP layer and the RRC layer. We uh, come up with a term called the CU, or the central unit, that does that. Okay? So essentially what we've done is we've disaggregated this whole thing. Right? And as you know, when you, when you disaggregate, you've got to create interfaces between the disaggregated elements so that they can communicate. So this interface here, which you can't see now, is... Um, well, uh, even I can't read that, but that's, that's packet-based front hall now, right? So that dotted blue line means that that interface is actually a packetized version of front hall. And there's a number of protocols we can use. The, uh, the, the front runner for that is East Cipri, right? Which is an enhanced version of Cipri that can carry the Cipri data over, um, over Ethernet, over IP. And then the interface between the DU and the CU is, is known as the high, la or, or the high latency front hall interface. It's also called a, a mid hall interface. You may have come across that, right? So it, it's the same thing. So the, the high latency uh, front hall interface, also called the F1 interface uh, by 3GPP, is running between these two elements. Okay, so now you've kind of sliced up these elements. You can do some pretty clever things with it, right? And in, in, a, in a complete cloud centralized RAN environment, what you can do is leave these RUs at the base station. You have to. I mean, they, there's no choice. I mean, um, so they, they stay there. The DU moves out. It gets centralized a bit. Uh, but it, you cannot move it too far out because there is a, um, a limit in terms of how much latency uh, there can be between the DU and the RU. So you constrain to something like 15 to 20 kilometers from the RU sites. Um, now the, the CU site can be further out there. It can be virtualized. It can be within the cloud itself because it's not performing any real-time functions that need uh, purpose-built hardware. And so that, they're set you know, further into the network itself. So you see that the whole nature of how we build a radio access network has, has changed here. Uh, and operators... Uh, will deploy this in different ways, right? A lot of the, a lot of the deployments happening um, today, or at least the early deployments, uh, are still DRAN. And, and, and the reason is that it's, it's a lot simpler to get it out there. Everyone's in a race to be the first to launch 5G services, so they, they're all doing that. But there are operators like, like AT&T, who are, um, uh, they, they're actually uh, going full, full out with the whole virtualization concept, right? So. Uh, they, there's a concept of virtual RAN 1.0, which, which virtualized this element. And at and uh, are, are, are going even further with that, right? And, and uh, talking about virtualizing some of, some of this as well. Um, so it's, it's a completely different architecture for 5G. Now, as, you know, what does it mean, mean for us? If, if designing a transport network, it has huge implications. Because now you've got to think about what sort of interfaces you're dealing with, where you're dropping. Um, traffic out, how much capacity you're driving over it, whether you use IP, whether you use optical, in a certain part of the network. So I hope I didn't confuse anyone. This is, uh, there's a lot going on here. 
but you know, from a from a sort of network topology, it kind of looks like this. So you got your uh, remote radio unit, the RU, your base, uh, the DU, um, the CU. That's the front wall interface. So that's the functional split, low latency. The functional split, high latency, and then your back wall starts at this point, which is a significant difference to how we did things in uh, with, with DRUN architectures, where the back wall actually started at this point here. So it's a mix of technology that'll be required through the network. Sorry? A CIPRI, uh, more like the e -Cipri. No, 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 on 5G, no. Okay. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be uh, well, you, you could, you could, right, for the, for the low bands, if you wanted to. I mean, it, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, right? In fact, a lot of the uh, early equipment out there doesn't really support e -Cipri either, so you might not have a choice uh, in terms of deploying it. There's nothing stopping you, uh, depending on how much capacity you're carrying, but you clearly don't want to be using it for hundreds of gigabits of, of traffic. Okay, so um, just to give you an example, right, um, that's, that's the amount of capacity required if you use uh, CIPRI, and, and, and how much you can bring it down if you use the different functional splits, so it's, it's actually quite significant. Okay, um, I better speed up here. Um, so, so the next generation core, so um, the, the core is that part of the network that was sitting right to the, to, to, yes? One millisecond latency requirement. No, one millisecond latency requirement is a, you know, is for applications. How you deliver it is up to you. Yeah. End, end, end to end. So you know, if, if your CU is too deep, then you won't be able to deliver that, right? Yeah. So, so in that case, you will have to distribute that function out closer to the users. Yeah. Um, okay. So you know, the radio access is one part of it. The other part is the core. And, and I'll go through this really, really quickly uh, because I'm running out of time here. Uh, so the core was a thing on the on the right hand side of that that mobile network, right? Now, now with 4G, we have a core. And, and it's got various elements there. Um, the the challenge that the the market had was that th there was, was a big driver to accelerate 5G deployments. And if you waited for all the standards to come out for the 5G next gen core to be ready, then it would have taken us another two years. So th th today there are a few different options on on how we interwork 5G with uh, with LTE. And and so the first the first option is is, is that it's called standalone, so you'll see that, right? SA, and a standalone means that you've got 5G radio connecting to 5G core, right? Simple as that. And you know that's it's actually a Korean operator is going to be doing that very soon, next 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 month. Um, the one that the bulk of the uh, early 5G deployments are using is what we call non-standalone, where we continue to use the 4G core but with 5G radio, right? Uh, and, and that means that we can roll it out quicker. So I will not go through this in detail, but they, they kind of, they, there's a few different options on, on how they can work. So uh, the dark colored ones are LTE elements, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the lighter blue ones um, are 5G elements, right? You can see that there's quite a few different um, combinations there. Uh, the most popular ones, uh, well, is, is definitely this one here. We're using um, new radio uh, in the radio access network, but then you're using the um, five, uh, 4G packet core. Okay, um, looking at the core once again, let's just speed up here a bit. In, in 4G architecture, maybe I should go back to that one there, okay. In 4G architecture, when you, when you look at the, uh, the main um, gateway devices, uh, we have the PDN gateway, and you've got the S gateway, the serving gateway. Now, the thing about the, um, the PDN gateway and, and the serving gateway is, is that they, they handle both the control plane and the data plane. So they don't handle signaling. Signaling is done by a different element, but they still have control plane um, capability running on the node. So the control plane kind of is, is co-resident with the data plane for, for 4G. Now, that's a bit of a bit of a problem because if you if you wish to break out your mobile traffic uh, in your network before it reaches that point you cannot actually do that without instantiating 
a gateway at that point because mobile traffic is carried in GTP tunnels and so on and they need to be, I mean, you, you've got you've to you know, terminate the tunnel somewhere. So uh, it, it became quite prohibitive for, for operators to distribute the, the PDN gateways and the S gateways. And in fact, you know, with, with LT deployments around the world, they've, even, even uh, in large countries, it's only a handful of uh, locations where they have these gateways. So a new initiative that kind of came about with 5G and is being rolled out to, uh, uh, it's been done in uh, LTE as, as well, is, is what we call control and user plane separation. Is where, you know, you, you take these functions and split it so that the control plane and the user plane can, uh, can be physically remote, but they can communicate with, with each other, right? So um, that is there with, with 4G now as well. With 5G, that was designed from day one. So we have a number of elements um, that, are, that are control plane elements in 5G, like the AMF, the SMF. And then you've got the UPF, the user plane function, that is purely a data plane function. Now, the beauty of this is, is that you can put this user plane function anywhere. And that means that you can, you can break out the traffic at any point where you have the user plane function terminating uh, the mobile traffic. So what that means is that you, know, you can do something like this. Right, so have a central site that has all the control plane functions, like all of these, uh, which I'll not go through in detail. But then you take the UPF, the user plane function, have it at different points in your network. And that's going back to your, to your question there, Siva, right? Uh, in, well, in a way. Um, that if, if you have this really low latency service uh, where you want to eliminate as many hops as possible, you want to host it as close to the user as possible. So by doing, by having a user plane function at this point, you can now serve the traffic from this edge cloud instead of taking it all the way to the core of the network. And depending on the service, you know you can have you know, different different uh, locations where you actually terminate the traffic. So for for uh, mobile broadband, it could be you know, at the next level down where you have caches and things, and, and you serve your traffic from there. So it, it gives you two things, right? Firstly, you don't have to carry the traffic um, through the entire backhaul network, and secondly, it reduces the latency um, for that service as well. So a really, really uh, important development there. Um, okay, let's skip this. So, you know, uh, I did some modeling for a customer in Asia Pacific um, recently, and they, they, they have, well, this is a sort of generic version of the network, but the, the intent for them was to, was to develop caches or to deploy caches in a few locations, and Really, what they, were, what they were hoping to do is, uh, you know, start off by terminating 5% traffic at this point, 20% here, and over time getting to a situation where 60% of the traffic is actually served from within the aggregation network, doesn't hit, hit the, the core itself. So uh, that has a dramatic Im uh, impact on uh, cap capacity required in the network. All right. Um, so last bit. I, I didn't think I'd get to this, but... Um, I guess I did. So how do we how do you dimension these 5G networks, right? From a from a backhaul perspective. Um, now this is this way. I think it's in instructive to look at look at how operators actually do do this, right? So there is a paper from the NGMN. Um, I've got a link here, uh, which you can read. But I'll try and summarize it for you, right? Um, in in a in a mobile cell, uh, things kind of work a little bit differently to what you might think. So when you have a busy hour, right? Now, uh, a busy hour obviously means that there's, there's more people trying to utilize the same resource. So if you take a single cell site or a single sector in a cell site, um, you see that in a busy hour, you've got a lot of these users in the cell. Now, the thing is, you know, some of them may be, uh, you know, there may be one, one person or a device sitting right underneath the base station, right? Beautiful link. Everything's all clear. Uh, there could be someone uh, further out at the edge of the cell. Uh, who's getting a pretty weak signal. There could be people, people inside buildings who are not getting the best signal. There could be people driving who are not getting the best signal. So there's a multitude of these users, right? And, and so your spectrum actually gets divided up between all of these uh, UEs, right? Users of the, of the spectrum. Uh, and what you end up with is, uh, this uh, graph is an example. So on the, on the uh, x-axis, you've got different uh, devices or the users. On the y-axis, you've got the, you know, the type of modulation they're using. So you've got 
you know, 64 QAM, you've got 16 QAM QBSK. And, you know, the, um, the higher, the, the better the modulation, the more uh, throughput you're going to get. So you see that some of these users are getting 64 QAM, which in this case here is the best, right? So that means they're making the best possible utilization of the spectrum. Some of them are not. They're getting, like, you know, QPSK, which is, which is the worst possible one you, you want to get at that point. Uh, so when you average out what everyone is getting, you find that the, the actual throughput you're going to get during the busy hour is actually a lot less than the maximum ca capable within that cell, simply because there are different users using the spectrum in a different way, and it's all being divided between them. Okay? So you end up with a cell average that is actually substantially lower than you would get otherwise. Now, that's busy hour. Now, during a quiet time is when you get peaks, right? So, so assume that it's the middle of the night and you're, you know, you've taken your iPad and you're sitting right underneath the base station. And you get your best link. So this is one, one, in this example, one user, and he has a good link. He's getting 64 quam. He's using the entire spectrum. And that's when he, you get peak rates, all right? So the, the, the thing to, I guess, really get out of this is that the peak rate in a cell is not during busy hour. It's quite different to how we build IP networks, where you, know, you get the peak rates during your busy hours. Uh, but here, in a mobile network, the peak rates is more likely to happen during a quiet, hour, a quiet time, where there's fewer users in the network itself. Uh, what you get uh, here is, is the more likely average. And that's what I was getting at earlier, right, when I showed the peak and the average, where the peak for 5G was gigabits per second, but the average was still a few hundred megabits per second, because that's what you're going to get. So it, 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 it sort of bears to, to keep that in mind, right? So when we, when we provision uh, capacity for a single cell, then we've got to think about not just the average bandwidth, but the peak as well, because the average may be much, much lower, but you've still got to give the, the user the ability to peak up to that rate, and, 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 the, and the transport network, the backhaul network, should not be a bottleneck that prevents that from happening, right? So essentially, what this is saying is that when, you, when you're considering n number of cells, then what you've got to provision is the max of either the peak, or the max of the peak, or the uh, number of cells times the busy hour average, okay? So what that, I'll, I'll give you an example, and I'll jump, so let's go through an example. So, whoops. A simplistic example, you've got uh, a, an aggregation network here. You've got uh, a pair of core routers per city. It's a national core. Uh, four aggregation pairs per core. Four pre-aggregation pairs per aggregation pair. And four cell side router rings. Uh, oh, sorry, eight cell side router rings per pre-aggregation pair. And there are four cell side routers in each cell side router ring. Right? It's a nice uh, even network, uh, which you'll probably never see in practice. Um, so what we want to do here is try and see how we can dimension this network, right? And this is an actual exercise that I did for, a, uh, for an operator here. So let's just look at this, right? I'm, I'm using the same case that we used earlier, right? So the uh, 3.5 gigahertz uh, within the 5G um, spectrum, 100 megahertz of that 64T, 64R. There's a bit of LTE, there's a bit of 3G, and all sites are trisected, right? So in this configuration, uh, if you recall, what we worked out is that for 5G, the downlink, um, the average spectral um, efficiency was this, right? 3.69, there was 6, that was roughly half of that. And so what, what we end up with is for 3G, the peak throughput was worked out to be about 21 megs, but the average is only 5. For 4G, with 256 QAM, it was 780, and the average throughput was 120 megabits per second. For 5G, it was 9.75 gigs, but the average is 600. So this kind of, once again, brings out the difference between peak and average, right, for a mobile network. So that's why, you know, when, when people say that, um, you know, 5G will replace all, you know, wired connections and uh, it's equivalent to fiber, not quite, not quite. It's slightly different here, right? We have to understand how this actually works. So when we apply that uh, equation to it, we see that, uh, sorry about that. We see that uh, the provision capacity on a, a cell set router will now depend on, you know, how many, how many um, cell side routers are in the ring, what is your peak traffic, what is your average traffic. 
So if, basically, we have to apply this equation. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But essentially, what it's saying is it's the higher of the peak or the sum of the averages. Okay. So in this case here, what it works out is that the, the CELTA router uh, has to cater for the peak of a single 5G cell, which is 9.75 gigabits per second. Because even when you sum up the, um, the average or the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the busy hour mean, it doesn't add up to that amount. So the, so the, the peak basically you know, dominates here uh, for the cell side router. Uh, and, and we keep going, right? We, we keep going to uh, uh, what, what we need in terms of capacity in the ring. So you essentially end up with, you know, in the cell side router ring, you need 10 gigabits per second. Within the pre-aggregation, you end up with needing about 70 gigabits per second. Within the aggregation tier, about 280 gigs. Within the core, 1.12 uh, tera. So these are the sort of numbers we're looking at. It's pretty, you know, pretty impressive in terms of you know, the impact 5G will have on IP networks. Um, there you go. Okay, so that was just an example, right? Uh, in, in reality, things, things are a lot different. Um, there'll be different functional splits. Well, what I assumed in that case was that everything was DRAN, right? So it's based on a uh, backhaul kind of architecture. Um, spectrum may be higher. There may be maybe um, high band spectrum as well, in which case that may, you know, having 10 gig links to the base station may not be sufficient. So we've got a new interface type um, that's, 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 that's emerging uh, of 25 gigabits, uh, 25 gig E on base stations. So a lot of the uh, early deployments will actually start off with 25 gigs to the cell site. So that's the kind of traffic we're looking at. Um, <coughs> okay, so I think I've just about lost, lost my voice here now. So I might just uh, sort of wrap it up here. Um, any, any questions? <coughs> right, I think I lost everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>